Stugatz here for Dollar Shave Club. We're all members here on the show. We swear by Dollar Shave Club. I love all their products. I really do. The six blade executive razor, the best razor I've ever used. Love that shave butter. They have other products as well, man. They have toothpaste. They have toothbrushes. They have shampoo. They have it all. It's Dollar Shave Club. It's how I get ready, but you're not me. You have your own way to get ready. You might shave your whole body to get ready for a bike race. Dollar Shave Club's executive razor and shea butter can help. You might do your hair to get ready for your soccer match. Mike does. Boogies by DSC can help you get your style right. The thing is, no matter what you do to get ready, DSC has everything you need. And right now, you can get ready with an amazing deal on any one of their starter sets. I recommend the Daily Essential Starter Set because I love the Amber Lavender Body Cleanser, but you can't go wrong with any of them. Head on over to dollarshaveclub.com slash Dan to pick your own DSC starter set for just $5. After your starter set, product ship at regular price, and make sure you check out their new video too. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash Dan, dollarshaveclub.com slash Dan. Great news. There's a quick way you can save money. Switch to GEICO. GEICO could help you get great coverage at a great price. And it only takes 15 minutes to see if you could save 15% or more on car insurance. Go to GEICO.com today and see how much you could save. Dan's not here. Get over it, people. <laughs> this is... I, uh, I had just told uh, Chris and uh, Billy right before Billy uh, just went out there with it. This is such a losing position. Turning on these microphones <laughs> and you expecting to hear Dan's voice. Tim will be here. Relax. He'll be here. At least they haven't had enough of us the last few weeks. I know. Too much. Too much. It is a huge week. Dan's returning. It is that special time of year. Our listeners really love this time of year. It's Suey Week. And uh, we're coming out of the box pretty strong today. I think we're playing a uh, musical performance and uncomfortable moment as our first two categories. So we do know Dan will be here. Dan he will indeed be, be here. Okay. He will be here soon. He Take might... a chill pill. Everybody needs to relax. We're back to normal today. It's fine. Yeah. We'll get through this together. Everybody, let's hold hands. We got this. Yes. Don't worry. We've built an ensemble here. Mm-hmm. All right? The show's been here. Yep. The show's been here helping you through Dan not being here. We're out here. We out here. Yeah. Uh, we played golf. Uh, most of us uh, on the show. Yeah. Uh, Greg Cody, Chris Cody, Sue Gatz, myself, Izzy. And uh, Izzy's partner, Anthony, uh, we all hit the links. Mm-hmm. Um, I looked tremendous in my outfit, neon pink shorts. Yeah. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think that golf course has ever, has ever seen somebody with a fit quite that good. Long sleeve shirt, long sleeve black shirt, which at first seemed like a mistake when we were out uh, hitting balls at the range, and then the the heavens opened up, and yeah. I was happy to have uh, that long sleeve shirt. Uh, in the face of a stiff breeze. Unfortunately, my partner, Stu Gatz, who I counted on being the best golfer, he was uh, such a trooper. He was battling a bad back. Yeah. Oh, he hurt his back that morning yeah. um, in preparation for the, uh, the the big game. So what you had was the Cody's running away with it. The two best golfers on the course that day were the Cody's. I have a couple of questions. What do you do with those pink shorts after? Like, do you wear them? If I had golf shorts, I would wear them like every day for all kinds of things that were not golf. But I feel like you strictly adhere to like the rules of this is for golf. I'm only wearing this for golf. Um, normally, I haven't worn my golf pants for anything other than golf. But uh, these uh, pink shorts are so fly. They're really cool. I need to find a way to work them in because they don't really match a lot of uh, the stuff. I got to go primary color just uh, to to counterbalance the bright neon pink shorts they're the type of pants that i can be sitting in front of you and your face would be adorned in a glow from my my shorts so they're pretty dope they're not something that i can wear to a formal event because they're shorts but i think in the summer of miami i'll fit right in i got shoes that match it too you look good i can't deny it izzy also looks good i don't know i don't know who i'm gonna vote for in of you two but you guys looked good here's the deal you at least looked good yeah because you didn't have much else going for you Oh, I had moments, Chris. I had moments, particularly the one ballsy moment where I bust out a driver on a 130-yard par three. And everyone was like, why do you have a driver out right now? And I'm like, guys, I'm hitting it well today. And what happened? Just mere yards from the, uh, from the cup. Just mere yards. Shut everybody up. Mid-range Mikey had a couple moments. Um, Sugats couldn't even, poor Sugats. I mean, what a yeah, soldier. What he a... couldn't even hit the driver. We were at a distinct disadvantage. So uh, the Cody's, what was your score? Uh, for the day, you were six under, I believe, for the eighteen holes. No, we were we shot two over. 
seventy four. All right. Yeah, we were one under. We were two under through like fourteen. We finished. We didn't finish strong. We we finished with like four bogeys out of the final five holes. Yeah, yeah. You started to unravel. Yeah. Um, Plus, you know, it wasn't really a match at that point. What so were the other scores? Also, you had about 11 T beers, um, <laughs> which might have explained the unraveling. Um, and uh, Izzy and Anthony tied with Stugatz and me. So we tied for second. With what score? Uh, 87, 88. And you had what? 74. You won by 14. 14 strokes. strokes. Yeah. What? Yeah, it was 74, 88. I saw the videos that you guys were putting up, and to be honest with you, Chris looked like the only one that knew what he was Chris doing. Chris is a really Everybody good... looked terrible. Let me tell you something. Sugat's but... included. Yeah, so, well, Sugat's is back, I'm telling oh, you. Oh, yeah, no, I know. Sugat's is a good golfer. He just was only able to be Do himself. we know that to be the case? I, I, because I, we listen, only hear tales of Sugat's golfing prowess from Stugatz. I feel like I'm the person that can speak on this. Uh, judging Sugat's game... He couldn't really let it rip. Like his, he was not himself. I don't know what his normal self is. With he the looked long like shot. Charles Barkley. No, no, no. It, within 150 yards, Stugatz was solid. Stugatz, like I can see that Stugatz plays golf, so he can get it done. It's just ugly. yeah. Like he had a few nice approach shots. He made a few putts. Um, I'm not gonna hold his back against him. Like if every time we go out there, he has a bad back, then I could hold that against it him. was a bad sign because i was making way more contributions than i had planned on and it wasn't because i was playing any sort of good golf it's because sugats especially early on was really strong. how did he hurt his back we, we just showed up and he was the first yeah, thing he, he said to us guys my back yeah there were there were i caught him a little bit uh, of an embellishment because when i first got there he said that it happened the day before um, while he, uh, well, cause he took a lesson, uh, I guess in preparation for what Chris Cody was bringing. Cause Chris Cody is, is straight up legitimately amazing. Is this what you're like, is this what you're best at? Cause you say you're good at everything and you're like, okay at things, but this you seem to be good at. Is this what you're best at? Golf is my best sport, I would say. Yeah. And at he, this point, at least. And for he sure. looks every bit of it. It's a beautiful swing and his scores are incredible. He, it, he was playing from the white tees, which was, a little unfair. Which I said on air on yeah. Friday. I was like, I'm going to be 100 yards out every why hole. Couldn't, why couldn't you just play from the blues and everybody I mean, else from the I, whites? Uh, Once you got uh, truly had that back in. I know it benefits me, but it is more fun to play at the same tee as everyone. Like, it's it's no fun if you're hitting first way back there and then you just have, like, it's more of a social thing if we're all it's also, standing around the same tee. It's also more fun if the score is closer than 14 right. strokes. Well, I didn't make the teams. I didn't set the rules. Stugatz is the one saying we're all playing. I think Stugatz was expecting me not to be as good as I was. Well, yeah, well, Stugatz definitely wanted to play from the white suit because he hurt his back and he couldn't drive he said he told me that he hurt his back um while he was taking the lesson and then he told everybody else that he hurt his back in the morning so i'm not really sure what to believe no i think he took he got a lesson first thing in the morning i think he got like an eight like an eight he was telling lesson. me abby was telling me last night that i shouldn't play oh. yeah so well, who knows uh, i'm not entirely sure roy were you bothered like i was that we weren't invited absolutely I mean, once I saw the videos, I'm like, I'm kind of, I'm glad I didn't waste my whole day. Doing it was that. a long day. Yeah, I mean, what time do you guys start? Because you were putting up videos until like four in the afternoon. I'm like, geez, can these people yeah, end was, already? This seems that was ridiculous. Another, that was another thing. Sugats lives in Parkland, which is, I mean, Sugats can wait or throw out a four hour variance. Hey, show up at eight. No, show up at nine. We ended up going out at eleven thirty. Takes me an hour to get up to Parkland from Kendall, Florida. So I have to. I was texting him in the morning. Just tell me what to do. So we we went up there. The Cody's live relatively close by, and uh, we were there for about, I want to say, an hour uh, on the range before we went out at 11.30, and we came... I got back to my house at like 6.30 in the evening. The the texts in the morning were right up Stugatz's alley. Like, we were all showing up there, kind of thinking in the back of our minds, Stugatz didn't have any of this planned. He made this plan an hour ago, because we, like, there was text right when you woke up, there was text, all right, guys, we might be delayed a little I bit. Two tea times. Like, we, at first we were supposed to be at nine something, and then it was Texas, oh, it's going to be at 10 something. So this was very sketchy. As soon as we showed up there, we were, once we saw Stugatz actually in the clubhouse, we were like, all right, we're probably going to play. That wasn't the only major uh, sporting development in South Florida sports or, or golf outing, it was a dress rehearsal. For the Miami Dolphins. Yeah. This is the game in which you can overreact to and say what you see on that field in this game is pretty much what your entire season is going to yeah. be. 
It was true for the Browns when they went undefeated uh, in the preseason last year. They looked incredible <laughs> in their dress rehearsal, and you could extrapolate that out towards a regular season. You can always knee-jerk to the dress rehearsal, and uh, there's a lot of red flags on this Miami Dolphin team. Um, there's still a lot of production, say what you will, about Jarvis Landry and how he caught 100 uh, balls by getting just 100 yards and however many jokes you want to do with your two-yard slant routes, that's a lot of production. 100 catches. Who's going to step up and get the catches? Because you didn't really add much to this team. D- is Albert Wilson the kind of player that's going to get you 100 catches? Or is Kenny Sills going to have to step up? Or are we finally going to see Devontae Parker? And I'm pretty sure I'm close to calling it on Devontae Parker. Wow. I'm, I'm pretty close. I know he's battled a lot of injuries. Early on, uh, a lot of foot injuries, and then if you hurt your foot, you you hurt a muscle trying to overcompensate for it, but he's just not looking good in practice. He's going up against Xavier Howard a lot, too, and Xavier Howard might be good, but uh, might be really good considering what we saw towards the tail end of last season and what we're seeing right now. But Chris, you as a Dolphin fan, are you a little worried? And Jarvis Landry isn't Jerry Rice. I understand that, but he's looking good in Cleveland, and he produced. Right? Are you a little worried that you don't really have an answer for that lost sort of production? I'm a little worried about the Dolphins in general, having seen them in the in the preseason. I mean, the offense, you kind of know what you're going to get from Tannehill. Tannehill's been really efficient, and the offensive line seems like they're going to be good at pass protection. So Tannehill should have time to sit back there, and I think that the receivers will add up. Like, I don't think you're going to get one guy that's going to do as much as Landry did, but I think Albert Wilson and Kenny Stills combined with Danny Amendola, if he can stay healthy, I think the offense is going to be fine. It's not going to be a top offense in the league, but it's just going to be like similar to what they've been, like efficient, maybe score some points. The defense is the big question mark. I have no idea what to expect from this defense. If the offense isn't fine, that would put Adam Gase's job in major jeopardy. Considering the moves that he's made and the Ajayi move actually paid off, because I think Kenyon Drake was actually giving your running game more of what Gase was looking for than Ajayi was. It just wasn't a fit. Kenyon Drake is kind of that guy that people are predicting to be the breakout star, and the Dolphins really need that. If if Kenyon Drake gets hurt or isn't what people are projecting him to be, then this could be just the typical Dolphins offense that scores 17 and 23 points. I mean, I don't think they're going to be bad, but they really need somebody, whether it's Kenny Stills, Albert Wilson, or Kenyon Drake, they need somebody to really... Like, wow us the first few weeks. You can't make some of these moves in in letting Jay Ajayi go, and he makes an immediate impact for Philadelphia. Seeing what Jarvis Landry um, might become in Cleveland and has been throughout the preseason in camp and, and in hard knocks, you need for those moves to not shoot this team in the foot with Adam Gase being an offensive mastermind. And you're, I'm pretty confident that Kenyon Drake can give you that same sort of production. It might be a nice little fantasy play, too, because I don't really see... Um, Chris, do you think someone's going to be a TD vulture against Kenyon Drake? I know uh, Billy has predicted Frank Gore going to be a, uh, a Pro Bowl. Yeah, yeah, and they, they saved him. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to get him hurt last game. Right. Um, I, I'm not really sure what to expect from Frank Gore. Billy's a, a lot more... Uh, I'm high on Frank Gore. On Frank Gore uh, than, than most are. But I think the offense absolutely needs to be absolutely needs to be good for Adam Gase to to stay here through this season. Because if it's a bad season, you could at least point to, well, they got rid of Sue and they just need to tidy up that defense. We have one of the bright, young offensive minds in this league. But he can sort of ruin that reputation. There was another main talking point from this game. And this one actually became... Uh, a national talk, a talking point. Like, is this a story we should be having fun with, or is this a scary story? No, I'm not going to have fun with it because I, I saw the clip and uh, uh, as it happened, um, and I was sort of really made uncomfortable. Not nearly as uncomfortable as I was uh, when Luke Keekley had an emotional breakdown and was crying because he had suffered a concussion and an injury at the same time, and it was just made me really uncomfortable to watch football. This was something that. I laughed at in the replay and and John Harbaugh. What we're talking about right now is Kiko Alonso running to the wrong side of the the sideline and staying there for a really uncomfortable amount of time. It wasn't just he he got upended and he had his head down running to the sideline. I know he said he had his head down, but you watch the replay. His head wasn't down. He he just went straight to the the Ravens sideline and stood next to John Harbaugh for what felt like an eternity. (laughs) And John Harbaugh had to tell Kiko Alonso, hey, you're on the wrong sideline. And Kiko didn't seem to be really laughing about it uh, in the moment. 
went to the sideline. Some teammates had fun with it. And then he had his post game um, interview. It was odd. It was odd. And look, I don't know Kiko Alonso all that well. I've seen him. He's been on the show. Um, he seemed to have more personality when he was on our show in this uh, post game press conference. I, I know I, I read Jason Leisure, who's by the way joining us in studio on Wednesday, so we can actually have someone who knows what they're talking about here uh, when it comes to the Miami Dolphins, and maybe he can explain some of this stuff. To, but he didn't seem like he was having fun with it in the post game, and that seemed to me like something that if that's a, a genuine mistake, you're going to try to have a little bit more fun with. But it sort of seemed like was a concussion. At play here, is he trying to defuse that? It was all in the post game reaction. It was all way too serious for me to just say, okay, uh, maybe it was just a brain fart. And if you didn't see it, he it wasn't like the play was had nothing to do with him. He made the tackle on this play, and his excuse was that he just got turned around, that he made a tackle, got flipped over, popped up, and just made his way to the sideline, and. Yeah, like I, like you said, it seems like something that if it was genuinely not a concussion that everyone would be laughing about, but it just, there was an eeriness to that interview's post game that I was just like, I don't know. It's tough to figure out what it was. So I was in the locker room for this and, um, I wasn't there for the interview scrum, but I was there beforehand and he tried his best to avoid all interviews with the, uh, with the press. I'm like, he was going to the shower. He's like, and the Dolphins PR guys is like, back, back. Get back, get back. Let him get dressed and everything. So they really didn't want to talk to him at all about it. But he did end up talking to the media, and he gave this interview, which just left me feeling even more eerie. I think if you go back and you think you can see the whole thing, you know, I just did a flip over the guy, and I kind of just, like, went over, let my head down. Like, I, I was totally fine. Like, people obviously right off the bat were like, oh, my God, he's going cut. I'm like, no. And then it clicked in your head everybody was the wrong color. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but then, you know, they're about to make the play. They're like, oh, get out of here. And then they're about to do the play. And I'm like, I don't know. I got to go back. Again, I don't know Kiko Alonso all that well. Maybe Chris is a Dolphin fan. He seemed lighthearted the one interaction we've had with him. But a reporter was even trying to give him, hey, a, a light vine to sort of escape out of. And we were just sort of buried uh, in super serious, uh, explanation. And he looked like he had just played a football game. I don't want to get into whether or not he looked glassy because full disclosure, I don't necessarily know how Kiko Alonso looks most post games. I'm not over there interviewing him, but I know Chris Nowitzki, the former wrestler turned, uh, uh, researcher when it comes to, uh, concussions has analyzed the clip and he sort of, uh, uh, countered everything that Kiko has said in defense of it not being a concussion. Chris Nowinski has put himself out there saying that it's his feeling that uh, Kiko Alonso was concussed because Kiko Alonso was saying he had his head down, running to the sideline and whatnot, and he diffused everything. It could have just been something where he got confused and he gets to the sideline and he doesn't want to admit that it's something football-related, that he's just trying to, like brush it away as just a brain fart but that brain fart could have been caused by something that is a little scary well i think uh humor injecting humor into something um usually improves something that's really bad and maybe that's something that we should have thought about doing with this segment <laughs> support for the dan levitard show podcast comes from our friends at rocket mortgage by quick and loans let's talk about buying a home for a minute because of rising interest rates, there's a lot of unpredictability when it comes to buying a home these days. It's causing a lot of anxiety and stress for a lot of people. Well, our friends at Quicken Loans are doing something about that. They're calling it the power buying process. Here's how it works. Quicken Loans will verify your income, your assets, and credit in less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval. That gives you the strength of a cash buyer. Then once you're verified, you qualify for their all-new, exclusive Rate Shield approval. This is very cool here. First, they'll lock your rate up for 90 days while you shop. Now, here's the best part. If rates go up, your rates stay the same. But if rates go down, your rate also drops. Either way, you win. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, simple. Go to rocketmortgage.com slash Stugatz. Rate shield approval, only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply. Based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records, equal housing lender, license in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030.
Don Lebatard. Papi, who is your favorite NFL player? Oh, Kiko. Kiko is my man. Oh, Kiko. Yes. Kiko. Yes. Kiko. Yes. Kiko. Yes. Kiko. Kiko. Hold Kiko. on, Papi. We got a surprise for you, Papi. Wow. We got a surprise for you here. Hold on a second. Stugatz. Hello. Hello, oh. Papi. It's Kiko Alonso right there, Papi. Nah, that's Dímelo, not Papi. Dímelo, Kiko. Papi. Kiko. <laughs> Papi. Kiko, ¿cómo estás, Kiko? Todo bien, dímelo, ¿qué pasa? Oye, ¿me te gusta el arroz con frijoles? <risa> claro, mira. <risa> eso es lo que, eso es lo que te hace a ti ser un jugador bueno, mucho arroz con frijoles. Really? Okay. <risa> claro. Rice and beans Tomaduro. are the reason Kiko Alonso is a good football player. Oh, and also <risa> some bananas. This is the Dan Levatar Show with the Stukats on the ticket. I realize that I sound crazy to a lot of LSU fans. Yes, you do. Um, because I've been on record saying that I think the University of Miami is going to win by two touchdowns, at least two scores. I think it's going to be a 17 point victory for the Miami Hurricanes, uh, generally a laugher. So over the weekend, uh, I'm trying to get myself pumped up for this game and I am at a fever pitch really right now. This is a huge game. I'm going to the game, uh, in Jerry world. It is football time in South Florida, and this is the team to get most excited about in South Florida, your Miami Hurricanes. And I listen to LSU-specific podcasts, and I do this before big games. I like to get a better idea of my opponent, what they think of us headed into the game. Who does this podcast? Is this just like a crazy LSU person like you are for UM? Uh, Yes. Or is it like a responsible person? Well, I listened to several because I wasn't getting what I wanted, which was them to make me furious. And it did to a degree because Miami was a total afterthought. I listened to three that actually, I searched several, um, but only three actually discussed the game, uh, with any sort of attention. Most of it was just, uh, you know, buy you previews. We were an afterthought? Yeah, we were an afterthought because they're headed into this game and almost to a podcast that actually addressed it. They said LSU will win by a couple touchdowns. Wow. So they're completely looking past this game. Most of the podcasts that I heard, um, barely address the Miami game. A lot of teams, a lot of people just think the University of Miami is that team that lost in the Orange Bowl uh, to Wisconsin in their home stadium, the team that lost to Pitt, the team that got destroyed by Clemson. That's recency bias. That's not the same Miami Hurricanes that was playing for most of that season. It's certainly not the Miami team that beat the crap out of Notre Dame. It was a mash unit. I mean, look at Malik Rozier's weapons in that uh, in that Orange Bowl. And Langham has had a lot of big moments for this University of Miami. But he's not your outside threat. He, he, when you're counting on him to replace an Amon Richards, that's quite a severe drop-off. Uh, Michael Irvin II, an immense drop-off from Herndon, who's now in the NFL. Um, and you, I was reminded Mark Walton was supposed to be part of this team, uh, and we lost him early. Um, actually, it was an incredible job by Miami to even be in the position where they fooled a lot of people, I guess. That was the, nat- uh, the, the national narrative anyways. But LSU fans and LSU experts seem to think that that's Miami Hurricanes, and LSU is going to have no problem with the Miami Hurricanes. It's favored by three. Okay, They're, this is the Miami Hurricane team that's favored by three points. They're already looking past us going to Auburn. They think that they're just worried about the Auburn game. I mean, a three-point spread isn't. You're saying that like that's a big thing in our pocket. That's basically just a pick 'em game. But so it could go in. It could go either way. So basically, their crazy podcasts think it's going to be a blowout in their favor. We're kind of saying the same thing in our favor. We're at least talking about them. At least they're not even talking about our game. They're they're totally bypassing. That they're worried. They're worried about Auburn. They think this is a laugher. So you guys all think that UM's going to win this game? Yeah, yeah. I, Allison, I, who do you got? The expectation. LSU, UM. Where's the game, Allison? It's in it's Dallas. Dallas. It's, in, it's Dallas. in Dallas, Allison. Yeah. Neutral, Neutral site. Neutral site. LSU, uh, UM. Miami Hurricane. Miami's, minus three. Yeah, three point favorite against LSU. Sunday night game, right? Yeah. Sunday night in Prime Dallas. Who you got? Just to annoy Mike, I'll take Dallas. Oh! Wow. <laughs> wow. Why would you take LSU? Do you know who their starting quarterback is going to be? Ooh. Who? There you go. All right. right. Well, I can answer that question. The expectation is that the Ohio State transfer, Joe Burrow, is going to be the LSU quarterback. 
Um, that was a bit of a position battle. There's actually a lot of position battles at LSU. The receivers are really good. There's um, question marks in the backfield who's going to step up and replace guys. Their offensive line is a bit of a, a question mark, as is Miami's. Say, that's... It's very similar to our team in that skill position guys. The only a, question about this of... game is how much you is going to win by the end. A lot of pros on this team in the skill positions, but the line, you know, question marks. The offensive line seems to be, um, it, it, this is what's tough about camp, because University of Miami ones are going up against, uh, on that offensive line, they're going up against one of the better defensive lines in the country, um, especially when you talk about edge rushing um, in, in Jackson and Garvin and Rousseau. These are guys that uh, scouts project to be first round uh, talents at, at at pass rushing, so you, you, it's hard to get a gauge as to whether or not when the offensive line struggles, are they just struggling because they're going up against a monstrosity at D line um, that's littered with uh, first round talent. Um, LSU, I think, probably has even more question marks around their offensive line. And here's the thing: if you want to hold on to recency. And, and and claim that uh, Miami and Malik Rozier, the expectation is, I guess, from independent people, and I heard Kirk Herbstreit speak to this, is it's, can Malik Rozier uh, step up? Uh, the expectation is, I think, from a lot of people in the national media, is that's just who Malik Rozier is. And that was his first year as a starting quarterback. He's made incredible strides in some of the most frustrating parts of his game last year, which was Malik Rozier runs up the middle, gets you 15 yards. Well, that's a productive play. That's an element that we haven't really seen at the University of Miami. And then you watch the replay and you realize that he has a receiver streaking wide open 35 yards down the field. And instead of getting 15 yards on the ground, you could have a touchdown through the air. It seems as though Malik Rozier has improved that part of his game in the deep reads through camp. And Mark Richt, I've been tricked, but never by Rick. Never. This dude's honest uh, always with his appraisal. A little too honest, if you ask Brad Kaya about his quarterbacks. And it's not even a question who your starting quarterback is this year. It's Malik Rozier. The battle was for backup. We have a really deep backfield. You have the true freshman in Lingard. DJ Dallas has put on about 25 pounds since we last seen him, and he hasn't lost any of the speed. Travis Homer has played his way into um, the minds of a lot of uh, draft scouts out there. He's looking like a guy. He looked like a pro back last year. Lots of uh, similarities to Ryan Matthews, I think. Uh, in his game, and I'm a little worried about how much he seeks contact, but at least you know you have the depth that if you lose a Travis Homer, you have a DJ Dallas and Lorenzo Lingard that can actually step up and, and replace that. That was a big problem with last year. We started losing too many good players, and you realize that from the golden years, you still didn't have the depth. Mark Rick's been here a few years now, so now the guys backing up Mark Rick guys are Mark Rick guys. I know this is something that Canes fans don't want to talk about, but this is not a must-win game. You know that, right? What? I um. They could still do anything they want to do this season with losing this game. I just, I know, I, I think they're going to win. I think that they have a good chance to win. I'm just saying, playing devil's advocate. Even if they lost this game, you're getting are, out ahead. People of this. are going to freak out. Yeah. People are going to lose no, their not. mind no, if they not. lose this game. No, like, Mike, Mike, no, no. you're going to lose. No, your no. Mind. Mike's going to say you lost at the right time, which is exactly what's going to happen. You think that a loss here is going to shut up annoying UM fan? It's absolutely not because it's going to be. This is the perfect time to lose a game. I'm just saying, if you run the table and you're ten and one, eleven and one, you're in the conversation for the playoffs. Historically. Chris is right on the button, and Billy already knows the pivot. And yes, I'll, I'll do that. At it. I'm not, I don't even want to consider Miami losing this game, though, because my expectations for this season is for it to be better than last season. And you can't... When we played Wisconsin, um, we realized that we weren't on that level. And all the ACC chants that I was doing throughout the season uh, uh, about how this is a difficult conference and how our speed uh, against other teams holds up well... You can't lose to a program in LSU that has Ed Orger on his coach. LS. Stop saying LSU. <laughs> but it's a three-point spread. We could lose. Vegas knows more than we do. Like, it's probably going to be a close game. The University of Miami needs to be better than LS this season. They need to be. They are. I would they be, are. I would be so devastated if the University of Miami lost to LS and lost to, to the Tigers because my, my expectations for the season are bigger and better. LSU is number 25. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that that is a a, a, a a a team that's not figured to win its conference, 
a team that has the same question marks that seems to have been plaguing the last few coaches there, which is what's going to happen at quarterback. We know we have all these athletes. We recruit really well, but why aren't we winning national championships? It's going to be a great test for the University of Miami early on. It's going to be a great test for Malik Rozier, um, who the second he throws an interception in this game, I'm going to be cast with all sorts of doubt because he was a little too reckless. Um, and I'd much rather start off with the Savannah State. Has he been this way the whole way that I've been gone, Billy? Oh my God! Doing it's, this droning UM talk. The last like, segment was the Dolphins. The whole the time, the ho- droning UM Homer boy talk. Has yeah. he been getting away with this without anyone bothering him? No one's really holding me in check. In fact, uh, Billy's created this character that's just a Miami bro guy that um, I really sort of identify. I with. would not listen to What's this. What's up, bro? It's people. <laughs> My name's Jose, but I go by people. That I'd listen to. I would not listen to him droning UM guy about how he feels about Malik Rose. Why is that the show? You Rose, you're fine, bro. Fine, Get it right. Fine. Future Heisman winner. Welcome back. Which will give us uh, another opportunity to promote the Sueys uh, hey. this week. All right. Because uh, we actually changed Dan Mistake because, honestly, Dan, it felt a little mean. Uh, <laughs> there were so many mistakes. Yeah, Pobrecito, so bro. He's getting old. He's getting old, bro. Pobrecito. Well, after that, you go back to Dan Mistake. But, uh, so we made it just general mistake, but rest assured, it's mostly you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. I had a terrible kind of year. I had a terrible, oh, yeah, terrible yeah, year of mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Did you forget that also? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why I'm still in that character. That character is only no, supposed to be I, for you. Wait a minute. You hate a minute. You don't know why you're doing that character. I would do anything to hear segment after segment of the Miami bro character. What are you talking about? This is not character. This is who I am. You know who they're playing this week? You you missed a lot, Dan. Let me catch you up. You know who they're playing this week? LS. Not LSU, because we don't give them that U. They don't deserve that U. <laughs> That's only for us. You know how many wins they're going to have this year? 15. Maybe 16. <laughs> maybe 17. We'll figure it out. But you're not even a UM. Like, you didn't even go to the school. How are you? Bro, UM what does that even have to do with anything? That doesn't matter. <laughs> What does that mean? I grew up being a UM fan. I didn't need to go to the school to be a UM fan, all right? Joke's on you. I didn't go to school. Boom. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to GEICO. I'm as happy as a clam. Disclaimer. GEICO cannot guarantee you will be, quote, as happy as a clam, unquote. The GEICO legal team cannot accurately verify clams even experience the complex human emotional state known as happiness. As an invertebrate mollusk living half submerged on the ocean floor with no arms, legs, or wireless access, what's there to be happy about? A clam's all like, oh, I'm so happy I didn't get turned into New England clam chowder today. Pronounced regionally as chowder. Chowder. Oh, that's so fun to say. What were we talking about again? GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Don Lebatard. I've made a vow to not correct Stugatz all show today on any mistakes, not point out any of his mistakes as part of a continued quest to do better and be better. Stugatz. Yep, and I have vowed to try and be 1% less worse than I normally am. That's what you asked, and that's what I'm going to try to do. 1%. I'm trying here, man. I am. <laughs> this is the Dan Lebatar show with the Stugats on the ticket. Since you guys have been gone, I've seen three diehards. I think there's two or three to go. Oh, man, I missed out. I missed out on a lot. <laughs> you could stop now. I mean, it's yeah. the same problem. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. I mean, it's been like two weeks since I've seen them, but I went like on a binge where like every day I was, I was watching different ones. I watched the first one, and I had to watch the second one the next day. And I was watching with my girlfriend, fiance. And then the next, the next day... What? The next day I watched another one without her, but I didn't tell her yet. So don't tell, guys, if you see her, don't tell her that but I now, watched part how, three yet. How stupid do you feel about the very idea that you guys had no idea what you didn't know? You didn't know what you didn't know. I should feel dumb for not watching Die Hard. For no, for you, for laughing at the idea that we were calling Die Hard the best action movie of all time, uh, even better than the most recent Prisoner of the Moment, Mission Impossible. You were calling it that. I was calling Tango and Cash the best. And you, and you haven't seen the most recent Mission Impossible, so you can't really participate in that debate. But oh man, it's better than Predator. Easy. Yes, yeah, yeah, easily yeah. better yeah, than yeah. Predator. It is uh, easily is probably a stretch. It's Thank better than Predator. Predator. You really need to stop though after Die Hard. No, no, I need to. I need more. I need you need more. to stop trying to McLean. watch these. Oh no, that's enough. I need no. no I need no, more McLean. McLean. I need you more McLean. You're wasting your time. Wait a minute. No, Mike, no, no. Mike, hold on a second. Is this is Billy too young to remember us going to watch a Die Hard with Terrell Owens as a show, like with show listeners and everything? Is Billy too young to remember there on one of these terrible Die Hard movies? The uh, the plane was going down, and I'm pretty sure 
Um, that was two. That was two. Come on, Dan. That was at the airport. Well, hold on. Hold on. But we were watching one of the diehards. Spoiler alert. The plane. No. It, <laughs> look. The planes go down in all of them. There's one where Bruce Willis, spoiler alert, was riding a plane. He was just sort of surfing on a plane. Oh, that was two. That was two. No. It was a, it was a fighter jet. It wasn't a plane. A Wait, what? Jet. Is this right. one I haven't yeah, seen yeah. yet? Yes, yeah, it's yeah, one yeah. you haven't seen. What? This is a new one? Hold on a second. Spoiler alert. Oh, yeah. Really? You spoiler alert. You shouldn't watch that one. Yes. I understand the confusion because Die Hard 2, uh, is that one called Die Harder? That one. I think it's with a vengeance is two. No, with a vengeance is three. Oh, really? One, yeah, that's one where Sam right, Jackson inexplicably <laughs> is running the I just love the idea that the world to sequels you have about dying. That you have to keep dying in yeah. different ways. So die hard, die harder, die with a vengeance, die. How many different yeah. ways are we going to die? We've already died. So that's when the uh, Die Hard 2 is when the commercial airliner is uh, hijacked by terrorists. In Live Free or Die Hard, which is the fourth one, there is a moment in which McLean is surfing a plane. Wow. Okay. And in that, Billy, you're too young to remember this. Chris, you don't remember this. Either. I know Roy remembers this. We're, I'm sitting next to T.O. in the theater. I don't know. We got all sorts of crazy. It's, uh, we got like some Samoan fullback for the Dolphins is there with his whole family. The guy was famous because he ran through a wall in a weight room one time. Yeah. Reagan Mawai. And it wasn't just him. We had, uh, the, uh, the Dolphins, I think that Cam Cameron year, they drafted a bunch of, uh, Samoan. So we had Samson Satelli out there. Yep. We had, uh, we had a bunch. No, the theater Good was, old days, the man. theater was filled. I still want to do this. Paul Soli was out there. Oh, yes, Paul Soli I was. All the Samoans, all those bleeping Samoans. You have the sound of Mawia, uh, running through a weight room, weight room wall. We played that for about five years. Hold on a second though. Chris and Billy missed all of this. So we're in the theater watching this movie and I'm pretty sure that plane had like 081 on the side of it. And when it first appeared, T.O. elbows me and says, see, number 81, always a weapon. I love that. That has to have been live free or die hard in 2007. Oh, man. Boy, they don't remember. They don't know. Nah. Billy and Chris don't know anything. They don't know anything. Nah. Oh, man. Samuel L. Jackson was great. I love T.O. What an make, addition. Yeah. I love T.O. making Die Hard 2 all about T.O. I mean, that is it's tremendous. It's like Madonna and Aretha Franklin, of course. That's how divas do it. Everything was about T.O. A plane's going down. He's like, fighter jets. Yeah, that's me. I wonder why Donovan McNabb hated it. Billy was very excited, though. He had texted me while on vacation. I just watched Die Hard. Oh, it so was amazing. Excited. I said, how great is Ellis? Uh, Billy responded, what a moron. <laughs> Oh, you got man. mad at Ellis all these years later. Ellis, booby, you got mad all these years later. No, I mean, I could see what was coming. I was just like, come on, guy. You're a fool. Why are you trying to negotiate with terrorists? Don't do that. <laughs> Billy, we love this this movie so much that I'm pretty sure we had Ellis on. What? Just, just to say Hans, yep. booby. Yep. Just to say Hans, booby. Wow. And he did. What a get. Ellis. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed that three was not Christmas related because two was. One was. But three wasn't. I didn't like that. I'm the jumping off, bitch! That's the guy. Yeah. That is, that is dolphin football in the Cam Cameron years. This guy was in a weight room. He called himself a juggernaut bitch. And then the subsequent sound is, I want you to listen to this, him running through drywall in the weight room. <laughs> I'm the jumping off, bitch! Woo! <laughs> One in 15. <laughs> but more entertaining. I mean, <laughs> I yearn for those days. <laughs> when are we going to do another movie party? I thought we were going to do that with what happened we, to the, our we relationship with the director of Predator and Die Hard. <laughs> we were trying. I sent it out to ESPN first, and they're like, you have to work on the local level. Um, and so on the local level, uh, we tried to see if there was a money making opportunity here, and they were given uh, a couple of weeks. and. Um, here we are a couple of weeks from the release of The Predator, and I don't think we're going to be doing uh, Why can't a movie we do premiere. anything? I mean, Keegan-Michael Key was supposed to join us weekly. Mike, uh, why can't we do anything around here? We're the biggest bleeping sports show in America. Why can't we successfully I mean, achieve anything to, around here? To be fair, you said do it, but only if there's a money-making opportunity there, and sometimes there aren't money-making I didn't say actually do it and only if there's a money-making opportunity. No, I said do it, and then others were entrusted that as always with sales in this business, they're entrusted with making it a money-making opportunity. They don't, they fail, and then we don't do our event. I think it was me, Mike, who said that about the money-making opportunity. Right. Yeah. I've actually, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've actually learned from previous experiences. It's not just do it because then I just do it, and then everyone's like, "Well, where's the money?" 
So I try to handle it like, on the front end. This business this is the worst. It's the worst. It's a clown show. It is this business. Somebody bleeping, sell this for the love of God. We'll fill a theater for you. We'll fill a theater with people. I have an idea. We buy out the entire theater. We should just do it ourselves, man. No, no, we buy it out, and then we sell the tickets for a higher price. Money-making opportunity. Let's, not, let's do that, that locally. Let's not do it through 7, 9, year or anything. We'll have Stugat scalping tickets outside. This is unbelievable to me that I come back from vacation, and hey, the Predator movie, we just sort of forgot about it. Do coming? <laughs> I'm watching the scene now. It's a Harrier jet that uh, Bruce Willis is surfing on, and then he jumps off the jet and lands on a bridge. I mean, this guy. <laughs> Wait, how did this happen? I don't want to know. Which one was this? Was this four or five? This is Live for Your Die Hard. Four or five is when he finds out he has a son. And- whoa, whoa, whoa. And they're like, okay, Bruce Willis is too old, so let's hand it off to another guy. But it, And you just want to see McClain. Wait, he wasn't in five because he had a kid? That's my worry, by the way, now that we're on the subject. That's my main concern with the Fast and Furious franchise. Dom found out that he has a kid, and I'm worried that he's not going to be as Fast and Furious now because he has a kid to look out for. And that's, you know, that's really going to ruin this franchise. No, they should be, not have given no, him that he's kid. he's going to be faster and furious. Sir. He's going to be more fast and more furious now that he has a kid? I don't think so. When Brian had a kid... You know, he kind of, well, he got phased out for other reasons, too. But when Brian had a kid, he stopped being as fast and as furious. We can't afford for Toretto to not be fast and furious. Who's going to carry it? Ludacris? Tyrese? Tyrese is another interesting one. The Rock, no? Well, yeah, but The Rock is in a strange position because The Rock was a good guy, but these are kind of bad guys. And then he kind of finds these loopholes as to why he's it is doing, that he he's can doing in the with... movies what he did in wrestling. Yeah. Like he's a good guy, he's a bad guy, he's a good guy, he's a bad guy. But how many loopholes can there be, Dan, where the good guy can be working with the kind of bad guys because of the greater good? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's not my job to figure it out. I just think about these things. I'm worried. I'm worried about Toretto and his kid. How old is Toretto's kid going to be? Because Vin Diesel himself, he's in his 50s. There's a real chance that this kid could be 30-something years old. Oh, well, Mike, the, the, I, I don't. <laughs> what happened to the action star? Dwayne Johnson is 46 years old. He's the, like The action star is an old man throughout action. Jason Statham's in his 50s. Vin Diesel's in his 50s. Uh, Bruce Willis, <laughs> come on, knock it off with Bruce Willis. He's in his seventies. Uh, Clint Eastwood, he's in his seventies. No, he might as well be Clint Eastwood and and Gene Hackman are eighty eight. Like, let's stop. Yeah, but they're not doing movies anymore. What? Action movies. Tom Cruise Hackman's is fifty six. Oh, yes, yeah, he's great. yes, but he looks incredible. And honestly, I saw that that Mission Impossible movie. I'm kind of considering Scientology. There has to be something going on there. There has <laughs> that to be, he never ages. That he never ages. Am I aging because I have too many body thetans? This is something to consider. Well, I'd like to know what he's done in the last few years because he looked old in Jack Reacher. That that dreadful vehicle. He looked old in Jack Reacher, and now all of a sudden he's apparently like embalmed his whole body. But he doesn't look like he's had work done. No. He does kind of look like he is aging, but I think Jack Reacher is supposed to be more like this manly man. I know he wears Grizzled. flannel. Yeah. He wears flannel. Yeah. So I think by merely wearing flannel, he looks older. Jack Reacher was unspeakably bad. <laughs> Which, the original or the sequel? It's important. The original was pretty good. I don't know which one I was watching because I was watching it on African television. I don't know whether I was watching the original or the sequel. Was that a choice or were you in Africa? I just at home. I've got a satellite that package, that and you're... sometimes I want to check in with the African feet. <laughs> I just got on my yes on my television. Let's see it's, what's on in Africa. It's all the channels playing anywhere, and so I just decided what's on in Africa now. Let let me partake from their television buffet. If so was, so if... in Africa, there's always a television that has Die Hard on. It's like it's the same thing. They do, no, they had in Nairobi. They had a channel that was just the action channel, and I'm like, this would make oh, it wow. here. Like it was just, it was just action movie after action movie, and Jack Reacher was on it. Right? Yeah. What are we doing? What are we, we are doing? so far are behind are Africa. We... I mean, it's amazing. If it was Jack Reacher, never go back, Dan. That was two. Is that the one you were watching? I don't know which one I was Damn. watching. It was. I know it was the terrible one. Oh, that'd be two. I think. Well, the director from Jack Reacher was the one that did this most recent Mission Impossible movie, uh, this most recent Mission Impossible, and that's one of the greatest movies of all time. So yeah. the director knows what he's doing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Clearly. Right, yeah. Okay. Well, do you think it gets an Oscar nomination for Best Picture? Honestly. Uh, Billy, you saw it. Okay. Changed your life. Man. 
There's been a couple good movies that I've seen lately. I'm on a hot streak. By the way, we've gone over previews yesterday. Yesterday, I went to see Crazy Rich Asians, and I showed up 30 minutes late and got there before it started. 30 <laughs> minutes late, and wow. I got there before it started. 30 minutes of previews. Yes. 30 minutes 30, of previews. I'm, I'm, I'm embellishing a little. 27 minutes it's of previews. It's too much. It is. 27. You're right about this. It's too much. I, I bought the tickets. I, le- I left church. I bought the tickets. I had 15 minutes to get there. I go, you know what? I have time to get some McDonald's. I got McDonald's. Where was it? I don't remember. It was something. I got some sort of fast food. Snuck it into the theater, by the way. Eddie Play. That's, what? That's the move. You get. You go with, you know, put someone it, with put, a big put, purse. Put it on the pole. Do you, sneak, uh, do you like, sneak food into the theater? I've never been this brazen about it. I got the bag, put the bag in. I didn't even prepare it. Normally when I get a burger, I put the ketchup, I put a row of fries, oh put it back on. Didn't even prepare it. I was doing you all that You put a row of fries on your hamburger? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And if it's a double stack, which it was, two rows of fries. Put that on the pole, too. Do you put fries on your hamburger? Yeah. So I went in I went in with the bag, with the food. I've never done this before. I felt guilty while I was doing it. But afterwards, oh, my God. I was like, I can't believe I got, a, I got away with murder yesterday. You were eating McDonald's in the movie theater. I was eating McDonald's, and I had my McDonald's drink also. Huge purse. It was a huge purse. The drink was the in drink? there. Two drinks were in you there. You smuggled in a two drinks? Two drinks were in there. There was a McDonald's or Wendy's, whatever it was. There was that drink. Then there was another How lemonade. How big is your fiance? Bag. Oh, it was big. It was a big one. And uh, normally I get upset because I have to carry like her wallet and her keys and all that stuff. I told her, big bag. I think I think I could take uh I think I could take the thing. It was her idea. If I'm not gonna, you know, if I'm gonna have to throw someone under the bus. She said, you know what? I think we can take this in. Don't even start eating it. We'll eat it in the theater. I said, what a great idea. And then I was worried because I had to go to two different places because it was early and one place wasn't serving lunch yet. And I was like, I don't want breakfast at this time. And you know, I want a burger. I'm going to a burger place. I don't want to get you know, whatever, the breakfast. I don't want a big breakfast platter. Does the story come with an ending? I got it in. Damn. I got it in. I felt so bad because there was people next to me and I'm there and I'm going around. I did feel a little bit bad, but I felt like I got away with murder. Long story short, the point is... $2, had, get out of here. I had 15 minutes $2 to get, get out of here. In Billy's defense, there are a few better feelings than feeling like you got away with murder. I put that on the poll. Go, uh, no, I'm a, I'm scared of the feeling of feeling like I got away with murder. Well, don't it, murder people. This get out of murder. here. I'm not condoning that. I'm just saying the feeling of, hey, I got away with murder, that's a pretty good feeling. I, one of my greatest fears is the idea of murdering someone, covering it up, getting uh, got, get knowing, being the only one who knows that secret, and one day someone's going to catch me. That's that someone is me, right? So, guys, how's your back? Yeah. A little bit better today. Thanks for everyone. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate everyone asking. Took half an oxy. I mean, that's what I had to do. You got to do what you got to do, man. I mean, we got a game today, and I had to show up and play. And so I'm showed up, and I play. I'm playing. Uh, you guys, I heard you mocking me on the way in. Listen, I was thinking about this all weekend. I was thinking about this all weekend. I hate the guy who talks about golf all the time, and then I show up to play, and he says he has a back injury. That's on me. I did that to you guys. Now, I gutted one out, but I did that to you guys, but I'm not happy that I did it. I should have kept it to myself. If I'm going to play 18 holes of golf, I can't sit there and say, hey, guys, my back hurts. Can't do it. That's a terrible job. You'd kill the athlete who did it. You'd kill the athlete who made the excuse afterward. You, You killed LeBron for coming out. Uh, playing probably better than you do at golf and having a cast on his left hand. It was a terrible job by me. I mean, just terrific. And I will tell you, on my best day, on my best day, when I am right, I'm not better than Chris. I, we had no idea that Fat Chris was that good of a golfer. I mean, Chris is like a scratch well, golfer. No, but I, his father raves about Chris's golf game. He's a monster driver, right? He's got a monster drive. Uh, and Chris, it, it has appeared clear in a way that is shocking and really hard to admit. Chris is clearly the best athlete we have here. And Guillermo should be ashamed of that. Ashamed of that. And Roy, I don't know what you're throwing your hands up about uh, because Chris is clearly our best athlete. No, oh, come on, man. American Ninja Warrior, remember that? I, I remember that you lasted longer than everyone else. Yeah, yes. I would have lasted longer than him, I'll tell you that. Maybe, but if you want to do a full sp- of all the sports and see, like, we can do this. Roy, right? I think that Chris would beat you in a race. I think Roy. I, I think he would beat you. Oh no, that is absolutely not true. Oh no, I think Chris would beat you. We're going to have to do this. I'm yeah, ready. I think he absolutely. would. Okay, absolutely. I'll, I'll beat you with uh, Timberlands on. All right. We'll Listen, work. Chris is just a good athlete. You could tell by the way he swings a golf club. Like Chris can just play any sport. He's that right, guy. He shows what? up and he can play. We're going to open the national show with Chris and Roy racing in the street. That's where we are opening the national <laughs> show, and we're just going to explain to people uh, that look, we need to get this settled right now. 
because Roy has never participated in any of these races or anything. So get the TV crew ready and tell them we're back from vacation. We're already violating all the liability laws around here. Let's set up a race. First segment back, Roy and Chris. So after all that, I still got to the theater, and I still had like two minutes to spare. It was perfect. What was the movie? That story started. The point was for you to tell us the movie. Oh that yeah, you yeah, saw. yeah, yeah. I saw Crazy point- Rich Asians. Uh. It's, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. The only thing about it, the main character's name is Nick Young. So the uh. whole time I was imagining Swaggy P. The whole time. <laughs> What's that movie about? <laughs> uh, Guillermo, you are the worst, man. The worst. Like, figure out a way to shorten up your stories. You're just a yammering knob, man. I just wanted to walk you guys through what I did yesterday, you know? (laughs) The point you were going to review Crazy Rich Asians for us. Walk faster.